The Custom House, Part 2 Introductory to the Scarlet Letter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Custom House, Part 2 Introductory to The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne such were some of the people with whom I now found myself connected. I took it in good part at the hands of Providence that I was thrown into a position so little akin to my past habits, and set myself seriously to gather from it whatever profit was to be had. After my fellowship of toil and impracticable schemes with the dreamy brethren of Brook Farm, after living for three years within the subtile influence of an intellect like Emerson's, after those wild free days on the Assabeth, indulging fantastic speculations beside our fires of fallen boughs, with Ellery Channing, after talking with Thoreau about pine trees and Indian relics in his hermitage at Walden, after growing fastidious by sympathy with the classic refinement of Hillard's culture, after becoming imbued with poetic sentiment at Longfellow's hearthstone, it was time, at length, that I should exercise other faculties of my nature, and nourish myself with food, for which I had hitherto had little appetite. Even the old inspector was desirable, as a change of diet, to a man who had known Alcott. I looked upon it as an evidence in some measure of a system naturally well balanced, and lacking no essential part of a thorough organisation, that, with such associates to remember, I could mingle at once with men of altogether different qualities, and never murmur at the change. Literature, its exertions and objects, were now of little moment in my regard. I cared not at this period for books. They were apart from me. Nature, except it were human nature, the nature that is developed in earth and sky, was, in one sense, hidden from me, and all the imaginative delight wherewith it had been spiritualized passed away out of my mind. A gift, a faculty, if it had not departed, was suspended and inanimate within me. There would have been something sad, unutterably dreary in all this, had I not been conscious that it lay at my own option to recall whatever was valuable in the past. It might be true, indeed, that this was a life which could not, with impunity, be lived too long, else it might make me permanently other than I had been, without transforming me into any shape which it would be worth my while to take. But I never considered it as other than a transitory life. There was always a prophetic instinct, a low whisper in my ear, that within no long period, and whenever a new change of custom should be essential to my good, a change would come. Meanwhile, there I was, a surveyor of the revenue, and so far as I have been able to understand, as good a surveyor as need be. A man of thought, fancy, and sensibility, had he ten times the surveyor's proportion of those qualities, may at any time be a man of affairs, if he will only choose to give himself the trouble. My fellow officers and the merchants and sea captains with whom my official duties brought me into any manner of connection viewed me in no other light and probably knew me in no other character. None of them, I presume, had ever read a page of my inditing or would have cared a fig the more for me if they had read them all nor would it have mended the matter in the least had those same unprofitable pages been written with a pen like that of Burns or of Chaucer, each of whom was a custom-house officer in his day as well as I. It is a good lesson, though it may often be a hard one, for a man who has dreamt of literary fame, and of making for himself a rank among the world's dignitaries by such means, to step aside out of the narrow circle in which his claims are recognised, and to find how utterly devoid of significance beyond that circle is all that he achieves and all he aims at. I know not that I especially needed the lesson, either in the way of warning or rebuke, but at any rate I learnt it thoroughly, nor, it gives me pleasure to reflect, did the truth, as it came home to my perception, ever cost me a pang, or require to be thrown off in a sigh. 
In the way of literary talk, it is true, the naval officer, an excellent fellow who came into office with me and went out only a little later, would often engage me in a discussion about one or the other of his favourite topics, Napoleon or Shakespeare. The collector's junior clerk, too, a young gentleman who, it was whispered, occasionally covered a sheet of Uncle Sam's letter-paper with what, at the distance of a few yards, looked very much like poetry, used now and then to speak to me of books as matters with which I might possibly be conversant. This was my all of lettered intercourse, and it was quite sufficient for my necessities. No longer seeking nor caring that my name should be blazoned abroad on title-pages, I smiled to think that it had now another kind of vogue. The custom-house marker imprinted it, with a stencil and black paint, on pepper-bags and baskets of anato, and cigar-boxes, and bales of all kinds of dutiable merchandise, in testimony that these commodities had paid the impost, and gone regularly through the office. Born on such queer vehicle of fame, a knowledge of my existence, so far as a name conveys it, was carried where it had never been before, and I hope will never go again. But the past was not dead. Once in a great while the thoughts, that had seemed so vital and so active, yet had been put to rest so quietly, revived again. One of the most remarkable occasions, when the habit of bygone days awoke in me, was that which brings it within the law of literary propriety to offer the public the sketch which I am now writing. In the second story of the Custom House there is a large room in which the brickwork and naked rafters have never been covered with panelling and plaster. The edifice, originally projected on a scale adapted to the old commercial enterprise of the port, and with an idea of subsequent prosperity destined never to be realised, contains far more space than its occupants know what to do with. This airy hall, therefore, over the collector's apartments, remains unfinished to this day, and in spite of the aged cobwebs that festoon its dusky beams, appears still to await the labour of the carpenter and mason. At one end of the room, in a recess, were a number of barrels, piled one upon another, containing bundles of official documents. Large quantities of similar rubbish lay lumbering the floor. It was sorrowful to think how many days and weeks and months and years of toil had been wasted on these musty papers, which were now only an encumbrance on earth, and were hidden away in this forgotten corner, never more to be glanced at by human eyes. But then what reams of other manuscripts, filled not with the dullness of official formalities, but with the thought of inventive brains and the rich effusion of deep hearts, had gone equally to oblivion, and that, moreover, without serving a purpose in their day, as these heaped-up papers had, and, saddest of all, without purchasing for their writers the comfortable livelihood which the clerks of the custom-house had gained by these worthless scratchings of the pen. Yet not altogether worthless, perhaps, as materials of local history. Here, no doubt, statistics of the former commerce of Salem might be discovered, and memorials of her princely merchants, old King Darby, old Billy Gray, old Simon Forrester, and many another magnate in his day, whose powdered head, however, was scarcely in the tomb before his mountain pile of wealth began to dwindle. The founders of the greater part of the families which now composed the aristocracy of Salem might here be traced from the petty and obscure beginning of their traffic, at periods generally much posterior to the revolution, upward to what their children look upon as long-established rank. Prior to the Revolution there is a dearth of records, the earlier documents and archives of the Custom House having, probably, been carried off to Halifax, when all the King's officials accompanied the British Army in its flight from Boston. It has often been a matter of regret with me, for going back, perhaps, to the days of the Protectorate, those papers must have contained many references to forgotten or remembered men, and to antique customs, which would have affected me with the same pleasure as when I used to pick up Indian arrowheads in the field near the old manse. 
but one idle and rainy day it was my fortune to make a discovery of some little interest. Poking and burrowing into the heaped-up rubbish in the corner, unfolding one and another document, and reading the names of vessels that had long ago foundered at sea or rotted at the wharves, and those of merchants never heard of now on change, nor very readily decipherable on their mossy tombstones. Glancing at such matters with the saddened, weary, half-reluctant interest which we bestow on the corpse of dead activity, and exerting my fancy, sluggish with little use, to raise up from these dry bones an image of the old town's brighter aspect, when India was a new region, and only Salem knew the way thither, I chanced to lay my hand on a small package carefully done up in a piece of ancient yellow parchment. This envelope had the air of an official record of some period long past, when clerks engrossed their stiff and formal chirography on more substantial materials than at present. There was something about it that quickened an instinctive curiosity, and made me undo the faded red tape that tied up the package, with the sense that a treasure would here be brought to light. Unbending the rigid folds of the parchment cover, I found it to be a commission, under the hand and seal of Governor Shirley, in favour of one Jonathan Pugh, a surveyor of His Majesty's customs for the port of Salem, in the province of Massachusetts Bay. I remembered to have read, probably in Felt's annals, a notice of the decease of Mr. Surveyor Pugh about fourscore years ago, and likewise in a newspaper of recent times an account of the digging up of his remains in the little graveyard of St. Peter's Church during the renewal of that edifice. Nothing, if I rightly call to mind, was left of my respected predecessor, save an imperfect skeleton, and some fragments of apparel, and a wig of majestic frizzle, which, unlike the head that it once adorned, was in very satisfactory preservation." but on examining the papers which the parchment commission served to envelop, I found more traces of Mr. Pugh's mental part and the internal operations of his head than the frizzled wig had contained of the venerable skull itself. They were documents, in short, not official, but of a private nature, or at least written in his private capacity, and apparently with his own hand. I could account for their being included in the heap of custom-house lumber, only by the fact that Mr. Pugh's death had happened suddenly, and that these papers, which he probably kept in his official desk, had never come to the knowledge of his heirs, or were supposed to relate to the business of the revenue. On the transfer of the archives to Halifax, this package, proving to be of no public concern, was left behind, and had remained ever since unopened. The ancient surveyor, being little molested, I suppose, at that early day with business pertaining to his office, seems to have devoted some of his many leisure hours to researches as a local antiquarian, and other inquisitions of a similar nature. These supplied material for petty activity to a mind that would otherwise have been eaten up with rust. A portion of his facts, by the by, did me good service in the preparation of the article entitled Main Street, included in the present volume. The remainder may perhaps be applied to purposes equally valuable hereafter, or not impossibly may be worked up, so far as they go, into a regular history of Salem, should my veneration for the natal soil ever impel me to so pious a task. Meanwhile they shall be at the command of any gentleman inclined and competent to take the unprofitable labour off my hands. As a final disposition I contemplate depositing them with the Essex Historical Society. But the object that most drew my attention in the mysterious package was a certain affair of fine red cloth, much worn and faded. There were traces about it of gold embroidery, which, however, was greatly frayed and defaced, so that none or very little of the glitter was left. It had been wrought, as was easy to perceive, with wonderful skill of needlework, and the stitch, as I am assured by ladies conversant with such mysteries, gives evidence of a now forgotten art, not to be recovered even by the process of picking out the threads. This rag of scarlet cloth, for time and wear, and a sacrilegious moth, had reduced it to little other than a rag, on careful examination, assumed the shape of a letter, 
it was the capital letter A. By an accurate measurement, each limb proved to be precisely three inches and a quarter in length. It had been intended, there could be no doubt, as an ornamental article of dress, but how it was to be worn, or what rank, honour and dignity, in bypassed times, were signified by it, was a riddle which, so evanescent are the fashions of the world in these particulars, I saw little hope of solving, and yet it strangely interested me. My eyes fastened themselves upon the old scarlet letter, and would not be turned aside. Certainly there was some deep meaning in it, most worthy of interpretation, and which, as it were, streamed forth from the mystic symbol, subtly communicating itself to my sensibilities, but evading the analysis of my mind. While thus perplexed, and cogitating, among other hypotheses, whether the letter might not have been one of those decorations which the white men used to contrive in order to take the eyes of Indians, I happened to place it on my breast. It seemed to me, the reader may smile, but must not doubt my word, it seemed to me then that I experienced a sensation not altogether physical, yet almost so, as of burning heat, and as if the letter were not of red cloth, but red-hot iron. I shuddered, and involuntarily let it fall upon the floor. In the absorbing contemplation of the scarlet letter, I had hitherto neglected to examine a small roll of dingy paper, around which it had been twisted. This I now opened, and had the satisfaction to find, recorded by the old surveyor's pen, a reasonably complete explanation of the whole affair. There were several foolscap sheets, containing many particulars respecting the life and conversation of one Hester Prynne, who appeared to have been rather a noteworthy personage in the view of our ancestors. She had flourished during a period between the early days of Massachusetts and the close of the seventeenth century. Aged persons, alive in the time of Mr. Surveyor Pugh, and from whose oral testimony he had made up his narrative, remembered her in their youth as a very old but not decrepit woman, of a stately and solemn aspect. It had been her habit, from an almost immemorial date, to go about the country as a kind of voluntary nurse, and doing whatever miscellaneous good she might taking upon herself likewise to give advice in all matters, especially those of the heart, by which means, as a person of such propensities inevitably must, she gained from many people the reverence due to an angel, but, I should imagine, was looked upon by others as an intruder and a nuisance. Prying farther into the manuscript, I found the record of other doings and sufferings of this singular woman, for the most of which the reader is referred to the story entitled The Scarlet Letter, and it should be borne carefully in mind that the main facts of that story are authorised and authenticated by the document of Mr. Surveyor Pugh. The original papers, together with the Scarlet Letter itself, a most curious relic, are still in my possession, and shall be freely exhibited to whomsoever, induced by the great interest of the narrative, may desire a sight of them. I must not be understood as affirming that in the dressing up of the tale and imagining the motives and modes of passion that influence the characters who figure in it, I have invariably confined myself within the limits of the old surveyor's half a dozen sheets of foolscap. On the contrary, I have allowed myself, as to such points, nearly or altogether, as much license as if the facts had been entirely of my own invention. What I contend for is the authenticity of the outline. This incident recalled my mind in some degree to its old track. There seemed to be here the groundwork of a tale. It impressed me as if the ancient surveyor, in his garb of a hundred years gone by, and wearing his immortal wig, which was buried with him, but did not perish in the grave, had met me in the deserted chamber of the custom-house. In his port was the dignity of one who had borne his majesty's commission, and who was therefore illuminated by a ray of the splendour that shone so dazzlingly about the throne. How unlike, alas, the hang-dog look of a republican official, who, as the servant of the people, feels himself less than the least, and below the lowest, of his masters. 
with his own ghostly hand the obscurely seen but majestic figure had imparted to me the scarlet symbol and the little roll of explanatory manuscript with his own ghostly voice he had exhorted me on the sacred consideration of my filial duty and reverence towards him who might reasonably regard himself as my official ancestor to bring his mouldy and moth-eaten lucubrations before the public do this said the ghost of mr surveyor pew emphatically nodding the head that looked so imposing within its memorable wig do this and the profit shall be all your own you will shortly need it for it is not in your days as it was in mine when a man's office was a life lease and oftentimes an heirloom but i charge you in this matter of old mistress prynne give to your predecessor's memory the credit which will be rightfully its due and i said to the ghost of mr surveyor pew i will on hester prynne's story therefore i bestowed much thought it was the subject of my meditations for many an hour while pacing to and fro across my room or traversing with a hundredfold repetition the long extent from the front door of the custom-house to the side entrance and back again great were the weariness and annoyance of the old inspector and the weighers and gaugers whose slumbers were disturbed by the unmercifully lengthened tramp of my passing and returning footsteps remembering their own former habits they used to say that the surveyor was walking the quarter-deck they probably fancied that my sole object and indeed the sole object for which a sane man could ever put himself into voluntary motion was to get an appetite for dinner and to say the truth an appetite sharpened by the east wind that generally blew along the passage was the only valuable result of so much indefatigable exercise so little adapted is the atmosphere of a custom-house to the delicate harvest of fancy and sensibility that had i remained there through ten presidencies yet to come i doubt whether the tale of the scarlet letter would ever have been brought before the public eye my imagination was a tarnished mirror it would not reflect or only with miserable dimness the figures with which i did my best to people it the characters of the narrative would not be warmed and rendered malleable by any heat that I could kindle at my intellectual forge. They would take neither the glow of passion nor the tenderness of sentiment, but retained all the rigidity of dead corpses, and stared me in the face with a fixed and ghastly grin of contemptuous defiance. "'What have you to do with us?' that expression seemed to say." The little power you might once have possessed over the tribe of unrealities is gone. You have bartered it for a pittance of the public gold. Go then and earn your wages. In short, the almost torpid creatures of my own fancy twitted me with imbecility, and not without fair occasion. It was not merely during the three hours and a half which Uncle Sam claimed as his share of my daily life that this wretched numbness held possession of me. It went with me on my seashore walks and rambles into the country, whenever, which was seldom and reluctantly, I bestirred myself to seek that invigorating charm of nature, which used to give me such freshness and activity of thought, the moment that I stepped across the threshold of the old manse. The same torpor, as regarded the capacity for intellectual effort, accompanied me home, and weighed upon me in the chamber, which I most absurdly termed my study. Nor did it quit me when late at night I sat in the deserted parlour, lighted only by the glimmering coal-fire and the moon, striving to picture forth imaginary scenes, which, the next day, might flow out on the brightening page in many-hued description. If the imaginative faculty refused to act at such an hour, it might well be deemed a hopeless case. Moonlight in a familiar room, falling so white upon the carpet, and showing all its figures so distinctly, making every object so minutely visible, yet so unlike a morning or noontide visibility, is a medium the most suitable for a romance writer to get acquainted with his elusive guests. There is the little domestic scenery of the well-known apartment, the chairs, with each its separate individuality, the centre-table sustaining a work-basket, a volume or two, and an extinguished lamp, the sofa, the bookcase, the picture on the wall, 
all these details so completely seen are so spiritualized by the unusual light that they seem to lose their actual substance and become things of intellect. Nothing is too small or too trifling to undergo this change and acquire dignity thereby. A child's shoe, the doll, seated in her little wicker carriage, the hobby-horse, whatever, in a word, has been used or played with during the day, is now invested with a quality of strangeness and remoteness, though still almost as vividly present as by daylight. Thus, therefore, the floor of our familiar room has become a neutral territory, somewhere between the real world and fairyland, where the actual and the imaginary may meet, and each imbue itself with the nature of the other. Ghosts might enter here, without affrighting us. It would be too much in keeping with the scene to excite surprise, were we to look about us and discover a form, beloved but gone hence, now sitting quietly in a streak of this magic moonshine, with an aspect that would make us doubt whether it had returned from afar or had never once stirred from our fireside. The somewhat dim coal fire has an essential influence in producing the effect which I would describe. It throws its unobtrusive tinge throughout the room, with a faint ruddiness upon the walls and ceiling, and a reflected gleam from the polish of the furniture. This warmer light mingles itself with the cold spirituality of the moonbeams, and communicates, as it were, a heart and sensibilities of human tenderness to the forms which fancy summons up. It converts them from snow images into men and women. Glancing at the looking-glass, we behold, deep within its haunted verge, the smouldering glow of the half-extinguished anthracite, the white moonbeams on the floor, and a repetition of all the gleam and shadow of the picture, with one remove farther from the actual, and nearer to the imaginative. Then, at such an hour, and with this scene before him, if a man sitting all alone cannot dream strange things and make them look like truth, he need never try to write romances. But for myself, during the whole of my custom-house experience, moonlight and sunshine and the glow of firelight were just alike in my regard, and neither of them was of one whit more availed than the twinkle of a tallow candle. An entire class of susceptibilities, and a gift connected with them, of no great richness or value, but the best I had, was gone from me. It is my belief, however, that had I attempted a different order of composition, my faculties would not have been found so pointless and inefficacious. I might, for instance, have contented myself with writing out the narratives of a veteran shipmaster, one of the inspectors, whom I should be most ungrateful not to mention, since scarcely a day passed that he did not stir me to laughter and admiration by his marvellous gifts as a storyteller. Could I have preserved the picturesque force of his style, and the humorous colouring which nature taught him how to throw over his descriptions, the result, I honestly believe, would have been something new in literature, or I might readily have found a more serious task. It was a folly, with the materiality of this daily life pressing so intrusively upon me, to attempt to fling myself back into another age, or to insist on creating the semblance of a world out of airy matter, when, at every moment, the impalpable beauty of my soap-bubble was broken by the rude contact of some actual circumstance. The wiser effort would have been to diffuse thought and imagination through the opaque substance of to-day, and thus to make it a bright transparency, to spiritualise the burden that began to weigh so heavily, to seek, resolutely, the true and indestructible value that lay hidden in the petty and wearisome incidents and ordinary characters with which I was now conversant. The fault was mine. The page of life that was spread out before me seemed dull and commonplace, only because I had not fathomed its deeper import. A better book than I shall ever write was there, leaf after leaf presenting itself to me, just as it was written out by the reality of the flitting hour, and vanishing as fast as written, only because my brain wanted the insight and my hand the cunning to transcribe it. 
At some future day, it may be, I shall remember a few scattered fragments and broken paragraphs, and write them down, and find the letters turned to gold upon the page. These perceptions have come too late. At the instant, I was only conscious that what would have been...